Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, October 1st, 2018. I am Dr. Pamela Gay and I am here to put science in your brain. Uh, today we have a roundup of a variety of stories coming to us from astronomy and space science. I'm going to go through these stories and then afterwards take your questions. Uh, so here we go, starting out with a story of a sky aglow in ways we did not know. In this image, we see one of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field uh, optical images of a variety of different very distant galaxies. The Hubble Space Telescope over the years has been used a variety of times to take ever deeper and deeper images of areas on the sky that appeared to be completely empty in prior images. The question was, if you take an image that is long enough, is there anything, is there any place in the sky that is truly empty? The answer, well, so far has turned out to be no. In this particular Hubble Ultra Deep Field image, we have turned up a myriad of very distant irregular galaxies that are just forming in the earliest days of our universe. You can see that they are often twisted and deformed and this is because well these galaxies are still forming they're still getting their spiral on you might say. Well, astronomers here on the planet Earth have been using more ground-based telescopes to follow up on this system and find out, well, what else might be lurking in the vicinity of these galaxies if only we look at this patch of the sky long enough and detect the, well, scarce number of photons that's coming from this basically empty part of space. When a group of astronomers followed up on this region, which is located in the constellation Fornax and was observed for the first time back in 2004 using 270 hours of Hubble time. Well, when they followed up using the ground-based very large telescope down in Chile and the MUSE instrument, what they found is the entire region is filled with a diffuse glow of Lyman alpha emission. What this means is this region is filled with hot hydrogen gas. Early on in the universe it appears that well hydrogen gas was everywhere which we kind of knew and it was heated up and giving off light which we didn't know. Lyman alpha emission is caused by the electron in the hydrogen atom jumping from the second energy level down to the first energy level and giving off a characteristic color of light that, well, here locally we see in the ultraviolet. Because our universe is expanding, these galaxies are essentially getting carried away from us and their light is getting shifted redward. This means that a color that would appear ultraviolet in a color of blue, too blue for our eyes to perceive, this ultraviolet light will get shifted into the blue, into the green, into the red, even into the infrared if it's moving fast enough. Well, in this particular instance, this ultraviolet light has been shifted into a variety of colors that, well, we could perceive with our own eyeballs if it wasn't quite so faint. So this is an amazing discovery. Next time you go outside and look up, realize that all that blackness, well, it isn't black. It's actually glowing with the light of warm hydrogen gas that permeated the first days of our early universe. Now, the scientists involved with this study, they don't actually fully understand why the universe is lit up. Uh, here, I'm going to read exactly what they wrote. However, as the faint omnipresent glow is thought to be ubiquitous in the night sky, future research is expected to shed light on its origin. Now, the reason I read that is because it's a fabulous little hidden pun. Uh, the research is shedding the light on the light. Um, now, I just ruined the pun by explaining it far too much. But what this is saying is... We now know there's this cool glow pretty much everywhere. We don't know why it's out there, but now that we know it's there, 
well, lots and lots of teams are going to try and figure it out. This is why we do science, to figure out what we don't know and then try to understand, well, what it is so that it's no longer an unknown. Moving on to other stories of the distance universe. Here I have a video showing a three-dimensional representation of the distribution of dark matter in one small region on the sky. A team of scientists using the 8.2 meter Subaru telescope located in Hawaii have been observing uh, distant galaxies and through their observations looking to see how the light from these galaxies has been well reshaped by intervening matter. Dark matter is this annoying material that we know exists not in a smooth continuum but in a lumpy bumpy structure all throughout our universe. This matter that doesn't behave the way you, I, our tables, chairs, computers, it doesn't behave like normal matter. It refuses to interact with the electromagnetic spectrum. It doesn't reflect light. It doesn't shine. But it does exert gravity. And the gravity exerted by this material is able to pull on photons and take light that might be headed in one direction and bend it in a new direction. By bending the light, dark matter is able to act like a lens and we're able to detect the dark matter through this bending. On average, we expect distant galaxies to average out to be a disk on the sky. So if I observe dozens and dozens of galaxies out at a distance of 5 billion light years, I would expect the average of those shapes to be a circle. If I, aver if I observe another dozens and dozens and dozens that are located 8 billion light years away, I'd expect them to average out to be a circle. It turns out, though, if you observe across the sky all these galaxies at a variety of different distances, they don't average out to be a circle. In some places, they average out to a teardrop. In other places, they average out to a slightly flattened bug shape. And all these different non-circular shapes indicate how intervening invisible matter has gravitationally, well, bent the light of these distant systems. By looking to see how these non-circular shapes vary from patch to patch, we're able to map out, well, what matter was required to create this shape, to create this shape. And we don't just do this for um, the, the entire sky at once, we also do it for a variety of distances. By comparing how galaxies that are 8 billion light years away are warped compared to those 5 billion light years away, we can map out the distribution of dark matter as a function of distance. Now the region of the sky that we see in this particular image is quite small, but what this team has found is that these red areas of extreme density in the dark matter map out to match what was expected from what we saw in fluctuations in the light from the cosmic microwave background. It's believed that the fluctuations, the hot spots and cold spots that we see in the most distant light that we're able to observe in our universe, this cosmic microwave background, the light that was emitted when atoms were first able to form, when electrons and protons first came together to, well, like I said, form atoms and photons were finally able to fly free. That light where it's hot reflects places where there was a lot of matter in the early universe. Where it's cold, it reflects places where there wasn't a lot of matter in the early universe. And those places with lots of matter should have gravitationally continued to pull together more and more matter over time. Those cold places would grow over time to be empty voids. It's hard to think of how an emptiness grows, but if you imagine the places with lots of stuff pulling material towards them, while the empty places fail to pull anything in, you have the voids growing while the dense places get denser and denser and denser.
These results are consistent with what was observed from the Planck satellite, showing that we are able to slowly understand our universe one piece at a time as we observe it in both the, the plane of the sky and in distance, which corresponds to time. Now, one of the things that did come out of this was it appears that these structures may be growing slower than we had previously experienced. Those over densities are pulling matter into them slower and massive objects are growing slower. And this may simply be the area of the sky that they looked at. As I said, this is a very small area on the sky but it's still something worth noting and something for further follow-up observations and comparisons with other, well, regions in space. Now, continuing our look at how our universe is changing over time, our extragalactic explorations, we have a tale of, well, in this case, one group of galaxies ramming in to a giant cluster of other galaxies. This hot spot that we see in the left, this purple region, this is the cluster of Bell 2142. This is a massive cluster of thousands of galaxies. And where we see purple, this is x-ray emission that was detected by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. This purple region corresponds to places in a bell 2142 that are heated up to millions of degrees. This area is hot, it is dense with gas and dust, and this marks out the center of this cluster. Now off to the distance we see this other strange um, arrow of hot x-ray emission. And this particular strange arrow of emission is blown up here on the right. And what it corresponds to is a group of galaxies in the process of falling into a Bell 2142. Groups of galaxies are, well, maybe dozens of galaxies in size. Our own Milky Way exists in a galaxy group rather than a galaxy cluster. These systems do have their own gas and dust and star forming galaxies. And over time, as structures continue to form over time, galaxy groups get gravitationally pulled in to the massive clusters and superclusters that trace out the large scale structure of our universe. Here what we see is this particular group of, of galaxies, as they fall in, you end up with a tight column of, of hot material that then goes on to fan out. This material is interacting with the outermost areas of the cluster, areas that we can't see when we look at the hot gas and dust. This is thinner, more diffuse material, but the act of this group ramming into that material is enough to start to deform the galaxy cluster, which is held in to this column initially by magnetic fields. As the system falls, the outer tail of this material fans out, perhaps indicating that there's great, greater turbulence in that particular region. This is one of the chances that we get to see exactly what happens when a group like our own falls into a cluster, as we know we will someday fall into the Virgo supercluster. One of the amazing highlights of this system is the places that you see the brightest emission. That corresponds to radically star-forming galaxies. So as clusters fall in, as groups rather fall into clusters, they turn into this arrow shape. They light up with star formation and they fan out through turbulent interactions with the surrounding medium. This is just one picture of what our future may turn out to be. Um, again, this is an image brought to you by the Hubble X-ray Observatory.
Now bringing things a little bit closer to home, but not too much closer to home, I have an update on the New Horizons spacecraft. This little tiny mission is on its way uh, out to the outer parts of our solar system. Having visited Pluto and Charon, it is on its way to yet another Kuiper Belt object. In this case, it's Ultimate Thule, which is... Um, one of the more excitingly named objects in our solar system. Uh, it turns out that, well, this particular system is one that may have a ring, it may have moons, and to try and figure out how to account to all of these it may have, the New Horizons team has undergone a dress rehearsal of sorts where they've tested tested their operational readiness using a three-day simulation. During the simulation, mission members uh, took artificial data, in this case, uh, one group of uh, members of the scientific research team generated uh, artificial simulated images. They generated simulated spectra, and they fed this mission to the team as though it were data coming off the spacecraft. And the team members that weren't part of creating this artificial data then had to respond to the data as though it were the actual mission going on. This dress rehearsal, this operational readiness test was a complete success. And the crew now feels themselves ready for the actual, well, the actual encounter with Ultimate Thule, which is going to take place on December 31st and January 1st. Now this encounter, just like the encounter with Pluto, is just a flyby. There's no chance to steer the spacecraft. There's no do-over if any of the observations they want to capture aren't captured. And because the mission is even further away from the Earth than it was during the Pluto and Charon encounter, there's a well, a great deal of lag between when we get the data and when the spacecraft can respond to our requests to do something new. Everything has to go exactly perfect. And currently it looks like it will. And when this flyby takes place, we're going to be here at CosmoQuest bringing you everything new as we learn it. So let's all look forward to something new and exciting coming from New Horizons in the new year. And that concludes all the stories that I've got for today. So if you've got any questions, go ahead and at me in the chat. As always, I'd like to remind you that the daily space is brought to you by CosmoQuest. Click on over to CosmoQuest.org and... Uh, get involved in doing some science of your own. Currently, there are a myriad of spacecraft out exploring our solar system, and they're sending back more observational data than we have scientists to process the information. Your help is always appreciated and needed to help us move through all of this information, map out everything that's going on on other worlds, and figure out where are the interesting places to scientifically explore and, well, where do we land our spacecraft where they'll be safe so that they can go and do that exploring. So check it all out at CosmoQuest.org. This is not the only show we produce. There's a whole variety of content that comes out over here on CosmoQuest X on Twitch. Give us a follow if you want to, well, get notified every time we go live. And as always, we are sustained by your subscriptions, and every bit really matters. So now for your questions. I see Space TV Net is asking, when is the next Astronomy Cast live stream? It should be Friday. Uh, Fraser is going to be back from his great explorations, and I, I will be in Australia, and I'm going to get my butt out of bed at 5 a.m. so that I can bring you something new over on Astronomy Cast. So, um, yeah, that's going to be a thing. Um, 
Yeah, Hanny, I'm not sure that we're going to get more heart hearts with Ultimate Thule. This is a much smaller object. It's not going to be a sphere. It's going to be, well, much more of a lumpy, bumpy, Rosetta-like object, I suspect. Not Rosetta, that was the spacecraft. A Sherry Geary um, object, like the comet that uh, Rosetta explored. So I see Fenring is asking, do we expect dark matter to interact with each other and eventually clump as well? Or do we think it might have whole number spin um, and doesn't follow the Pauli exclusion principle? So we don't know um, with the Pauli exclusion principle. Um, but the Pauli exclusion principle really refers to the energy levels that certain kinds of particles are allowed to have. So for instance, um, electrons um, and other, I believe it's leptons, uh, that form up are restricted to having a spin up and a spin down when they're in the same energy level. Now, we don't know the characteristics of, of dark matter nearly well enough to even begin to guess at this kind of will it, won't it interaction. What we do know is Dark matter in general doesn't seem to interact very well. It doesn't, um, it doesn't really collide. When we observe uh, galaxy clusters in the process of colliding, the dark matter appears to just pass through each other from the two different systems. And it doesn't collide and lump together and form shock waves and everything else that we see with normal luminous matter, baryonic matter. Um, we do know that it's gravitationally attracted to form halos. It does um, come together and form lumpy, bumpy structures. It's just not the close-in, high-density material that we get from baryonic matter. Um, I don't think that answered your question, but sometimes we don't know enough information to answer questions precisely. Bottom line, it does lump up, but it lumps up into a diffuse halo of material at the galaxy-sized structure, at the supercluster-sized structure, but it doesn't lump up to form planets and things like that. Um, Larry is asking, so you think the dark matter predates stars and dominated the first galaxy formation? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of really compelling theories out there that seem to indicate that the first structures in our universe were formed within uh, halos of dark matter that came together. So we had over densities in the dark matter that pulled the less, um, well, the less common uh, luminous baryonic matter into those halos. Uh, the majority of our universe is made of dark matter and dark energy. So, uh, yeah, this is appearing to be how it formed. The dark matter lumped up and the luminous matter fell in. Um, looking to see what else we have. Um, so Astro YYZ is asking, um, regarding galaxy nomenclature, what's the difference between a galaxy group and cluster? It's, it's entirely a matter of size. Uh, clusters uh, come in a variety of different sizes that are classified in different ways depending on who classified them. In general, we have the Abel clusters, which go from Abel 1 to 5 and very strictly by number and density. Uh, we have the less dense Zwicky clusters and as we get less dense and less numerous in terms of how many galaxies are involved we eventually start calling things galaxy groups. Uh, as always it's not a well-defined boundary between what you call a group and what you call a cluster but with the Abel clusters we're looking at thousands of galaxies and with a galaxy group we're looking at dozens and that's a couple order of magnitudes difference in size. Uh, looking to see if there's anything else. So Hanny Zorvirp was asking, was there ever a time in the universe where space was not black? So blackness scientifically just implies there aren't any photons here. And the universe has never actually been truly black. It's look how 
uh, minor are you considering? The earliest years of our universe, those first 400,000 years, uh, everything was amazingly dense, amazingly bright. Photons couldn't travel any distance at all between before they were absorbed and re-emitted. And everything was initially hot, dense, and bright. At about 400,000 years, we had the formation of the cosmic microwave background. This is that moment that I mentioned when electrons glommed on to atomic nuclei because it was finally cold enough for neutral atoms to form. And in that moment, uh, there was amazingly bright ultraviolet radiation released in all directions that because the universe has cooled and expanded, we now perceive as the cosmic microwave background. After that, for a while, the universe was cold. It was neutral hydrogen, neutral other helium, um, trace amounts of lithium beryllium, and nothing was emitting its own light, but the cosmic microwave background light was still bouncing around. Then after a period of time, we're still working to define that appears to have been maybe a couple of million years, maybe a few hundred million years stars began to light up, galaxies began to light up, and the photons generated in these stars began to add themselves to that cosmic microwave background. And so there's always been photons traveling however far or not far since the beginning days. And should you plop a detector down pretty much anywhere, as long as you're not in a super dense cloud of dust, you're going to catch photons. And even in that super dense cloud of dust, there's going to be X-ray photons. There's going to be gamma ray photons permeating that dust to be detected. Now, there are places that you might not detect anything if you look in visible light. There's going to be places you might not detect things in ultraviolet colors of light. But there is no place in our universe that is truly black in all colors that isn't inside of something. So I think it's fair to say that space is in some places faint, but fa space is nowhere black. And that's just an amazing thing to think about. Um, there's so many new names today. This is great to see. Welcome everyone who's new or who's simply chatting for the first time. Everyone is always welcome. Um, so Hanny is asking, is the local group um, stretching out? I'm going to rechange that. Stretching out like the Virgo cluster, like the galaxy group fe featured in the x-ray story. Not yet. It's It's still more of a splat of a group of galaxies without any specific elongated structure. Uh, but as we get closer, as we fall in and begin to act, to interact with the outer materials in the Virgo cluster someday far, far in the future, yeah, we're probably going to elongate the exact same way. Um, Larry then goes on to ask, uh, wait, no, I already got that. Um, so Larry then asks, so the hierarchy is the Milky Way, the local group, the Virgo cluster, the Virgo supercluster. Um, I don't know about Lana Kia. Um, so I, yes, as far as local group Virgo supercluster, um, that part is right, is right. Um, and, and Astro YYZ, that is an accurate emoji. For, for thinking about the universe. Um, and now I'm going to have to Google Lanakia. Um, uh, Cynicult is asking, how does a galaxy show as one unit when the light from the furthest point away can take many years longer to travel to us than the closest point? Well, it's all a matter of space being vast. Uh, one way to think about it is... Um, Everyone in New York City is effectively the same distance away from where I sit here in central, in southern Illinois. 
even though some of them are a few miles closer, a few miles far further away, for all intents and purposes, they're all the same distance. Now, when we look out at a globular cluster of stars, it's going to be hundreds to thousands of light years across. But given that its overall distance might be 65,000 light years away, um, that small difference between the nearest and furthest star is something that we can ignore. Um, as we get further and further away, uh, those differences minimize. Um, have you ever listened to an orchestra? The reality is the sound from the flutes and the piccolos in the front row reaches you before the sound of the timpani hidden in the back of the orchestra. And our ears don't get bothered by this difference in sound travel time. Our science, similarly, across the fullness of a galaxy in the distance, isn't bothered by the difference in the amount of time it takes for light from the nearest stars and the furthest stars in that distant galaxy to get to us. Um, plus, if we're trying to do anything where that those differences would matter, we have the maths to decouple everything. We do do that kind of maths when we're trying to sort out systems involving pulsars and other um, systems that we have the ability to make extraordinarily fine-tuned measurements with. Um, anything else out there for questions? I hope I answered your questions, cynical lad. Um, and it took me a minute to parse your, your username. Sorry for the complete mispronounce mispronunciation the first time I took a look at it. Um, thank you, DPI209. I appreciate that. That was just something I hadn't heard that phrase before. Um, so if, if there's no other questions today, I'm going to remind you, I'm going to be back here tomorrow. Same time, same channel, new science. Uh, the daily space is brought to you Monday through Friday, unless something weird is going on with the universe, which sometimes happens. And, um, we're always here to bring you the latest in astronomy and space science and, uh, invite you to join us over at CosmoQuest.org. CosmoQuest is a collaboration of a whole bunch of different people. Uh, there's me and some others coming to you from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. We have Dr. Matt Richardson coming to us from the Planetary Science Institute, as well as Annie Wilson out at Youngstown State University. Um, give us a follow. Find out whenever we go live, and we will always be here to put science in your brain. So wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. And remember, get outside and look up. Bye-bye.